Uh, greetings to you all. Today's teaching comes out of Psalm uh, 2, verses 7 to 8, and the Amplified Classical um, Translation reads, I will declare the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. This day I declare I have begotten you. So this is um, uh, Yeshaya telling the world what his father said to him the day he was born. Uh, the Jubilee translation say, reads, I will declare the decree the Lord has, has said unto me, thou art, my, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. The Living Translation, Living Bible Translation reads, His chosen ones replies, His chosen one replies, I will reveal the everlasting purposes of God, for the Lord has said to me, You are my son. This is your coronation day. Today I am giving you glory. So we have a slightly different slant from having begotten to the day that He gave Him here. He, um, he gave him the crown, he crowned him, his coronation day. But basically, in, in, in the, as far as the Bible is concerned, it's one and the same thing. The message translation reads, Let me tell you what God said next. He said, You are my son, and today is your birthday. Uh, what do you want? Name, nations as a present, continents as a prize. You can command them all to dance to you or throw them out with tomorrow's trash. Uh, I don't know whether that is quite uh, entirely uh, accurate because um, the, his whole idea, God's purpose was always to have a family um, and uh, his purposes will not be sorted by, there's nothing that can come in the way of his plans and his purposes. And then the Young's literal translation reads, I declare concerning a statue, Jehovah said to me, my son thou art, I today have brought you forth. So this is the day when God brought forth uh, Jesus. Now, now, there are a lot of questions around this, but anyway, let's try to leave some of these uh, issues for a little later. And now, having talked about his son, um, we, he now declares him to, to the world. He's made this uh, promise to him, and he now declares him to the world. And in Matthew 3.17, he says, The voice um, from heaven said, this is my son whom I love dearly, uh, my uh, dearly beloved son, and I am well pleased with him. And in Mark uh, 1, 11, it reads, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love dearly, my beloved son, and I am very pleased with you, uh, in whom I have great delight. Luke 3, 22 reads, and the Holy Spirit came down on him. This is... Um, at his baptism, uh, in the form of a bodily of a dove, then a voice from heaven said, "You are my son, whom I dearly love, and I am pleased with you." Um, in Acts uh, thirteen thirty-two to thirty-three, it reads, "And the Holy Spirit came on him." Talking about the the the, <clears throat> the scene in in Luke three two, uh, in the form of an, a, a a dove saying the repeating the same thing uh, in Hebrews 1 5 it reads this is because God never said now he's talking about why he is the anointed one the Messiah the chosen one and he says that this is because God never said to any of his angels you are my son today I, I have become your father I have begotten you nor did God say to his angel I will be your father and we know that in Isaiah 42, 1, he talks about, Behold my servant, talking about Christ, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom I, my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice and right and reveal truth to the nations. Um, on, this, on this scripture, the, the, that was the Amplified Translation. Um, the the voice translation reads, The eternal one, look here, let me present my servant. I have taken hold of him, he is my chosen, and I delight in him, and I have put my spirit on him, but this by this he will bring justice to the nations. And we also know in Genesis twenty two 
true that um, he had asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, and uh, at the last minute moment he told him, no, 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 I will sacrifice my son. So the anointed one is not was not a human was not born in the ordinary way that humans are born. In Hebrews 5.5 5, it reads, uh, So also Christ, the Messiah, is, uh, um, did not... Okay, this is what he says. So also Christ did not choose himself to have the honor of being or of becoming a high priest, but God chose him. God said to him, You are my son. son today I have become your father. I think uh, I've... I have begotten you. You are my son today. I have begotten you. Now, still talking about the son that he's, he's begotten. We'll come, we'll come to how he begot him uh, in a little while. But for now, in Revelation uh, 13, 8, it reads, and um, he's talking about how the whole world is going to be sacked, will we'll, we'll worship the beast. Um, but he says this of the son. This is uh, 30, Revelation 13, 8, and it reads, The lamb is the one who was killed, who was slaughtered before the creation foundation of the earth. So the, this is a very important point that actually what happened 2,000 years ago had already happened at the foundation of the world. That was just a manifestation in the physical but that it had already been achieved. Um, and in John 10, 8, it says, um, talking about him having been slaughtered, in John 10, 8, he says, no, listen, uh, this is Jesus to uh, Yeshaya speaking, saying, no, listen, um, no one takes my, took my life away from me. I gave it away for it. I gave it up voluntarily for those who were yet sinners. Um, and he had... And he told, and he said that I have the power, authority to give it up and to lay it down. And I also have the right to take it back. <clears throat> this is what my father commanded me to do. In Revelation 5, uh, 6, verses 6 to 8, uh, talking about um, the lamb standing in the center of the throne. Uh, and then the lamb looked as if it had been killed, slaughtered, yeah, because it had already happened uh, in eternity and had seven horns, that it means that he was in heaven. Uh, and then he was sent, um, and um, he, he was already, okay, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits um, that uh, were sent into the world. And the lamb came and he took and received the scroll, and when he took the scroll, the four living creatures uh, bowed down before the Lord, and they, um, each one of each of them had a harp and golden bowls of incense. And then they said um, to him, "You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were killed, slaughtered, slain with the blood of your death. Um, you bought the people for God." For every from every tribe, language, people, and nation, you and you made them to be a kingdom of priests um, for our God, and they will reign, um, and they will reign on the earth. Now, the the whole issue here, which is an issue that. You find in a number of religions, uh, especially the uh, the, the contenting um, religions in in the general uh, region where um, Hebrew uh, the Hebrew nation uh, emerged or was incubated or was brought forth, is that. Um, Christ, Yeshaya, is unique, he's special, and he's a tr is true God. Now, the question is, we also know from other scriptures, um, uh, Psalm 82, that there are other gods, but he's unique. God is unique. And now the question is, how, in what way is he unique? How is he unique? Um, 
in 1 Corinthians 8 to 6 reads, For there is only one God. There is only one God. All things came from him and we live for him. And there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things were made through him and we were all... We, we were made through him. So what happens is that we are saying that everything was created through Christ and there's only one God. Uh, in that way, they're unique. Suppose even all the other gods were created by Christ. And Colossians 1, 6, um, in Hebrews 1, 2, it says, but, but now in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. Um, God has chosen, appointed his son, to be uh, the heir of all things, and through him he made the world, um, the universe, the ages. Um, so everything was created uh, through him, and in that way he is unique. He's very close to God. And in Colossians 1, 6, it reads, um, Through his power in him, by him all things were created, things in heaven and in earth, things seen and unseen, all powers, heavenly authorities, authorities, dominions, kingdom, kingdoms, lords, rulers, authorities, and um, yeah, everything was created uh, through him, uh, through Christ and for him. And in Colossians 1, 20 degrees, and through Christ, God has brought all things back. Now, this is the whole, the, the whole plan. Uh, through Christ, he brought all all things back again, reconciled all things to himself, things on earth and things in heaven, uh, through the blood of Christ, Christ's death on the cross. So this act of um, saving his creation, uh, the family that he wanted, which he knew was going to be sinful, and Christ was assigned to rescue them, uh, to save them, uh, he was, through his blood, he was able to reconcile the rebellion in heaven, uh, the rebellion on earth through Christ and bring everything back into unity in him. Um, in Genesis, um, now, here is something that I don't see anywhere else in the Bible, and this is in Genesis, uh, talking about why he is truly unique. Uh, it must be the way that he came into being. This is my, what I'm thinking. Apart from the fact that we mentioned earlier that God is the source of all life and he gave life to Christ. Uh, what I'm saying here is Christ is a created being. Um, and Christ, through Christ, he created everything else and that makes him also unique. God is unique. His son is unique. And I'm trying to think of um, a way of trying to explain this from this from the scripture and this is in genesis 2 21 to 22 and it says so god caused man to sleep very deeply and while he was asleep god removed one of the man's uh, ribs then god closed the man's skin at the place where he took the rib and the lord used the rib from the man to make a woman and then he brought the woman to the man. Now, this is something that I, is not replicated anywhere else. And I am suggesting, and it seems reasonable to me, to say this is another way his he, the, the way he begot him was he took him from within himself. He came out of himself. He's part of him. And that is why he, in the Bible he talks me, the Father and I are one. The Father is in me and the Father is in uh, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And he's saying that he's inviting us to this unity that we can also join this unity and he is in us and we are in him. So, but in so far as how he came into being, this is how uh, it, it seems logical to say that he actually came from within him. He took him out of himself. He drew him out of himself. And that is also one of the reasons that that also makes him unique. And in John 5, 26, we know now, talking back to the fact that he's a created being, he says, uh, and life comes, he said, this is um, Christ himself saying, life comes from the Father himself, just as the Father has life. So he has allowed the Son to have a life in himself as well. That's the expanded translation. The voice translation says, um, you see, the Father radiates with life. 
he also animates the Son of God with the same life giving beauty and power to exercise judgment over all of creation. Indeed, the Son of God is also the Son of Man. Now, I think, th so the Amplified talks about the fact that in the, in a, even as the Father is uh, has life in himself and is self-existent, he is given the Son to have life in himself and also to be self-existent. The Nicene Creed captures some of these points and it says, um, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, uh, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one God, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father, which brings us uh, um, born of the Father, before all ages, God from God, which is what I've been uh, suggesting, light from light, because God is light, true God from true God, because God is true God, um, begotten, not made, uh, being thrown out of, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made, which is what we've just highlighted. Lighted. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate, of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and he rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And then we now come to verse 8, and it reads, If you ask me, this is the Father speaking to the Son, I will give you the nations as an inheritance, or the people on earth will be yours. And this is what he has given him. And what was the transaction there? What was the plan? So, um, in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world. So we are going to try and rearrange the scriptures and pick, uh, try and piece it together, perhaps in more sequentially. Um, so God says, um, in 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, and, uh, his only and unique Son, so that everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life instead of being utterly destroyed. Because you know that we are sinners and the consequence of death, of sin, is death. So he came to save. So which brings us back to the Nicene Creed. And uh, we say, read it now as follows. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father, before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. We go to Psalm 47 and 8, and it reads, Then he, I said, Look, I have come in a... In a I have come, it is written about me in the book, in the scroll. My God, I want, I, I want, I would delight to take, and I take pleasure to do what you want, to do your pleasure. Uh, your teaching instructions are in my heart. This is Christ. Um, Yeshaya, Hebrews 10, 15 reads, Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O oh God. That's the Philip's translation. Hence, when he, Christ, entered into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not decide, desired, but instead you have made ready a body for me to offer. That's the amplified translation. We go back to the Nicene Creed. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. Romans 3.25 reads, For God sent Christ to take the punishment for 
our sins and end all God's anger against us. He used Christ's blood with our faith as a means of saving us from his wrath. Remember that we are sinners and we fell in the Garden of Eden. In this, he has been uh, entirely fair, even though he did not punish those who sinned in former times, for he was looking forward to a time when Christ would come and take away our sins, which he did at the foundation of the world. Um, that's what the Revelation says. Um, so Christ came to die in our place and to take away our sins. He was a sacrifice of atonement, um, propitiation. It implies an atoning, atoning sacrifice. And uh, this is how we are saved. Because he died uh, in our place or in our stead, we being logical, so we must be, we must now live the life of the one who died for us, because he died for us, so we must continue living his life. Uh, it is not possible It is not possible to live a double life. You can't, there are not two beings uh, that are identical and uh, live simultaneously the same life. Even twins, they don't do that. Uh, we all, all have one life, so we must live his life, his sinless life, a holy and pure life, um, though on our part, not perfectly, we cannot do that perfectly, but we must at the very least strive to do so, strive to attain, attain perfection. This we are obliged and have, a, and have a duty to do. In John 10, 18, it reads, No one takes away my life from me. I lay down myself. That's what Christ says. He volunteered to do this because he knew that's what pleased the Father. Because God, his father had a plan, he had a project to have a family and he knew that the family was going to fail him. And so he made provision for it and he was prepared to fit into that. And he said, yes, I'll lay down my life to save um, uh, the creation, your children. Um, and then in Revelation 13, 8, we, we mentioned that again, the lamb, lamb is the one who has fast slaughtered the foundation of the world. And in Colossians 1, 20 says, And through Christ, God has brought all things to himself again. Um, reconciled all things to himself through that death and that uh, sacrifice. Things on heaven, in, on earth and in heaven, um, through the blood of um, the blood of Christ's death on the cross. Um, so, in the end, in Revelations 5, 6 to 10, we'll take it up to, and the song that they sang, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were killed, slaughtered, and with the blood of your death, your blood ransomed, uh, all the people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Uh, you have made us a kingdom of priests for our Lord, uh, and we are going to reign here on earth. So we are, we've just um, talked about, the, I think that's what, what the Bible is all about. It's all about Christ, uh, what he did for us, and how we should all live our lives, uh, live his life now because he died for us, a righteous and holy and pure life, a sin life, sinless life. And this is what it is. Um, and this is an arrangement, something that he offered to do at the foundation of the world, that he would die for, to save, to, to bring about this family that he wants, which is of human beings. And, um, yeah. So on this point, uh, we come to our point of introspection and meditation, and it reads from Revelation 10, uh, 9 to 11, um, from the expanded translation. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll, and he said to me, take the scroll and eat it. It will be sour, bitter in your stomach, uh, because it's the message of judgment, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey because it is God's word and because it brings salvation and vindication to his people. So I took the small scroll from the Lord's hands, from the angel's hands and ate it in my mouth. It tasted as sweet as honey, but after I ate it, it was sour bitter in my stomach. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many, um, this message 
to many people, nations, languages, and kings. Um, and in the contemporary English version translation for that last verse is, then some voices, some voices said, keep on telling what will happen to the people of many nations, races, and languages, and also kings. And this is the period, this is the warning of the last days. And our benediction comes out of Numbers uh, 6, 22 to 27, again from the expanded translation, and it reads, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you should bless the Yasha Elites. Say to them, May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord guard you. May the Lord show you his kindness, make his face shine upon you, and have mercy on you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord watch over you, lift up his face, presence, continents upon you, and give you peace. So Aaron and his sons will bless the Yasha allies with my name, put my name upon the sons of Yasha and I, Yasha El, and I will bless them. And in this way, they are to put my name on the people of Yasha El, so I will bless them. That last sentence is from the common Jewish Bible. And... Um, I would like to thank you all and may God bless you all.